Actually, she was my teacher in Montessori for a couple of years, a long time ago. In the primary. In the primary yeah. classroom. Mm -hmm. So she's been teaching for over 40 years. But this is just like family. So you don't realize what kind of resources you really have at your disposal, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, there's another very good family friend, Shashiant, who's, who's other, another Montessori teacher that we, uh, you know, that's in our. But, and Kim did not get this from any of them. Her, you know, walk into Montessori was completely unrelated. And different. It was the backdoor approach, as yeah. we call it, through my own yeah. child, children. So that's how a lot is coming to it. And maybe we can share Can that I experience. just uh, yeah, add? Absolutely. So here I am at, you know, teaching elementary, made in Montessori, and I see this lady who's pretty young, you know, with her age, you yeah. know, and she, and I said, I couldn't help it, you know. So I said, oh, it's wonderful to see you taking the uh, course at this age. I shouldn't have thought. <laughs> and then she said, oh, because I used to own a school. And so now I'm adding on. And so I used to have a little girl. And guess who she was? Oh, Shivali. 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 So, so that was Misinga, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So our daughter's Montessori teacher, that's how kind of we got into Montessori, was from Mount Airy, and she retired on Shivali's last year, which was her kindergarten year. Mm -hmm. And so she ended up going into Aiden. So it was just kind of like this, everything she comes She eventually came back to Montessori and yeah. took her elementary training, training yeah. and was at the Aiden Montessori School on her last days when yes. Rita Masi <laughs> met her, and they had this connection about Shivali Sioni, yeah. you know, and so it was like just very thin threads. And, yeah. and and she is how I got into Montessori, was, you know, through my daughter's experience with Miss Inga, and now Inga taking elementary and is working somewhere in D.C., right? Yeah. Um, but, so anyway, we're very honored um, and very blessed to have both of you ladies, and um, I know that you're going to share your experiences with us, and um, we're here to learn, so if you have questions, we'll, you know, feel free to... Um, them and uh, I know that Rina, you wanted to start off. I did, and I can sense the love of the child and being with children in this, you know, in the rooms and the teachers. So I feel I have to start with Dr. Montessori. And because you don't mind if I sit down, no. she was a medical <coughs> doctor and an anthropologist, and through her background, she observed that the child is in a constant state of growth. This metamorphosis of the child relates to the physical, mental, spiritual, and social aspects of development. Because of this, the child's needs are in constant state of flux. What he or she needs at three, <coughs> he or she may not need at the age of six. Maria Montessori noticed four stages or planes of development, the Montessori jargon, based on salient characteristics or manifestations. The first plane is zero through six years old, second plane six through 12 year old, third plane 12 to 18, and the fourth 18 to 24. So the first stage is further divided into zero or birth to three, and then three to six, that of the conscious um, fit, you know, mind. The second plane is six through 12 years, which is a period of uniform growth without much transformations. And the third plane is again a period of transformation, the 12th, the teenage the 12 to 15, and 15 through 18 is the year of adolescence. The fourth, 18 to 24, is a period where the individual just grows older. Today, we will consider the first, the characteristics of the first, and the second plane, the differences. And the first uh, plane child, we call the absorbent mind. And the second plane, we call imaginative reasoning mind. So now I'll tell you the differences. So the sensorial, the zero through six year old, the primary child, is a sensorial explorer. 
creates intelligence through sensorial exploration and classification. The six through 12 year old is the imaginative explorer, interested in what cannot be known by the senses alone. Again, the primary child is the absorbent, unconscious, receptive mind. But the second plain child, six year through 12, is the reasoning mind, capable of abstraction. This primary child is introverted in a way, works alone in the company of others, task is self-construction and the birth of the individual. Whereas the second plain child is extroverted, works in groups. The task is the, is the construction of a social being. The primary child explores the world through facts and reality, satisfied to know the answers to what Whereas the second plain child explores the universe through reason and imagination. Not satisfied with mere facts, but needs the reasons to why, how. The primary child is family and adult oriented. It's contented to stay with the family, wants to please the adult. Whereas the second plain child wants to be with the peer group, needs acceptance by the friends of the friends, moves outside the family from the foundation of love and security laid down during the first plane. The primary child needs limited single environment of the classroom, needs external order to build internal order. Whereas the second plain child needs double environment of the classroom and outside. No longer needs external order because internal order has been constructed. And this child could be messy. Doesn't <laughs> want to brush his teeth. Yeah. Doesn't want to take showers. <laughs> The primary <laughs> child repeats the same task until mastered or satisfied. And the classroom offers isolation of materials. The second plain child will not be content to repeat the same material, needs multiplicity of materials to be satisfied. Now the primary child is prone to childhood diseases, whereas the second plain child is healthy, strong, tough, wants little or no fuss over injury, mostly. <laughs> <laughs> the little one, the primary <coughs> child, wants to please the adult, believes what the adult says, and is acceptable without much questions, very trusting. Whereas the second lean child has a strong sense of justice and morality, wants to know what is considered right and acceptable to society. So I want to just quickly go through the characteristics of just the second plane because our whole curriculum is based on that. And so the second plane child has enormous intellectual powers accompanied by physical strength and stability. <coughs> Real <coughs> intellectual work can be accomplished. He, has in, he or she has interest in everything and can do anything. Needs complete vision and unity, not bits and pieces. Needs to know how life and knowledge are interrelated has tendency toward maximum effort, not just satisfied with little jobs, little lessons, little efforts. And maximum effort is accompanied by joy. This child is bored if not as asked to do enough. 
cannot help but be interested in life around her. A strong sense of justice and searches for morality to determine what is good, what is fair. This fairness is very marked, very, very marked. This child will want to know why you did what you did. The tendency toward hero worship and the heroic endeavor is there. They have this herd instinct, must be part of the peer group and be accepted. The hunting instinct comes, wants to know the functioning of everything, worms, insects, you name it, and he's interested. Wants to know the reason, wants to know how it works, how and why. And they are venturesome and daring and has the tendency for exploration. And still needs repetition of an activity to master it. But it must be an amplified process, not content to repeat the same thing. And needs toward self-evaluation, needs to assert self and directly own the development. Now, based on these characteristics, Maria Montessori based her curriculum and called it cosmic education. But I want to quickly go through some chapters because the characteristics are what the teachers we keep looking for and we base all our teaching accordingly. So Montessori teachers take into consideration all these second plane characteristics and they weave stories into the lessons to arouse the children's imagination and flame their interest. Montessori education gives the vision of the whole. In so doing, we try to give the universe to the child and sow the seeds of culture. Hence our curriculum is such that the children are able to see the unity and order and interrelatedness of the parts of nature that are animate and inan inanimate. The sun, the air, the wind, rocks, plants, animals, and humans. So the children realizes this interconnectedness. So we start with the lessons of the physical and the spiritual needs of humans. We animals do have the physical needs, food, shelter, transportation, defense, but only humans have the spiritual needs that of art, culture, vanity, religion. And then we have the key lessons and we start all of our main subjects with these key lessons. The great stories and their key lessons are integra integral components of a Montessori elementary education. And I think I'd like to introduce, ask uh, Jennifer. Jennifer to kind of introduce you to our great story of how the earth, that was the first one, and the, this is the timeline of life. So, um, thank you. So what she's talking about is in the beginning of every year that we um, work with the children, we tell five great stories. And of those five great stories, it opens up our curriculum for biology, geography, history, language. And the first great story that we tell is uh, called God with No Hands. And that story is the story about um, the coming of the universe, how the universe formed, and it gives a lot of impressions that um, there were all of these elements and all of this craziness, and we needed order. And it, in order to have order, there needed to be laws. And in order to have uh, all this chaos calm down, all of these elements had to follow their laws. So when air got hot, it rose, uh, and it took water with it. And um, when 
water got cold, it became solid, and it became ice. And uh, so we tell these stories about the coming of the universe, and then we lead into the coming of life. The one thing that created order was life, and all life on Earth has a cosmic task. So we have this timeline. This is the timeline of life. And it starts off with a story about, we, we give these, um, now in the second plane, the child is really starting to use his imagination. So we give these allegorical stories, something that you won't see in the primary because they just want things that are real. They want real life things. But now they want that imagination to be sparked. They want to be excited and they want to know that there's other things that have these needs. And in turn, it gives the child this, this gratitude for what they find, and for that Earth belonged to animals way before we got here. So we start with the trilobites and with just these little animals, and we tell them that the animals, they had uh, two tasks, <coughs> that they could eat and that they could reproduce, that they could multiply. And from eating and from multiplying, over time, we show a rise in time that there were trilobites and that there were all these different animals. And we get them really excited about the animals that show up. And we talk about cronids and that these are the first <coughs> plants. So right away, there's animals and plants, and this is all life that's just being created in the sea. And so we go on and on, and the story has many more details, but we don't give all the details because there's so much going on on this timeline that the children, they get excited, and if we give them every little piece of information, then I've already done all the work for the child. The child's work is for them to explore more. Part of the human tendencies is to explore. So if I show the children this and just point out a few things, like a cephalopod, he has legs on his head, and that gets them excited because oh, there's legs on someone's head. <laughs> and we start to talk about plants that pop up out into the air, and the air was toxic, but the plants, they're excited about this air, and they're filtering the air, and then some plants, they wash up on the shore, and they say, hey, feels pretty good up here, I'm gonna stay on this land, and some go back into the water, and eventually they learn to live on the land, and the plants, they filter the air, and that gives way for uh, amphibians to come up, and they figured out how to grow legs. <coughs> but they grew legs, and they started to live on land, and that the first sound on Earth that they <coughs> ever heard was the sound of a frog. <laughs> and then we start talking about more plants that show up in different elements, such as coal and iron, and then down here you can even see that we have um, pictures of maps, and we just kind of refer to that the, the Earth was changing, and we talk about the reptiles, and that some uh, animals, they figure out how to fly and that the reptiles grew and grew and we don't know why, we don't know how, but the dinosaurs, they, they disappeared. And then we talk about animals that were flying and then all of a sudden mammals show up and mammals, they figured out how to keep their babies inside of them so that it was safer than just animals that laid eggs. And after all this time, look at all the time that it took for the earth to prepare for it to be okay and ready for all of these animals, all this time that passes. But there's one animal I haven't mentioned, and that's us. All this time for the earth to be prepared for humans to arrive. And then we leave it at that. We don't ask questions. We just let it sit as an impression. And they can take the timeline out, and they can look at it more and in more detail. And this sets so much for biology, for research, for them to look deeper into history, to look at the plants. And this is just one of the great stories that gives them all of this idea and this interrelatedness and this interconnection that animals did so much for humans to prepare the earth for us to come here. Because when we came here, we had fundamental needs that we needed to satisfy. We needed to eat. We needed shelter. Eventually, we needed clothing. We needed to work in groups. And then we're relating it back to the children. The children who want to work in groups, who like to eat. Or maybe we'll be cooking together, food preparation. Mm -hmm. And so much more that the children make this connection back to the early humans. And then again, bringing up that, that, uh, that gratification to the humans that came before us. And then there's just so many more lessons that we go into 
when it comes to gratification about the humans, the unknown humans who, who invented the chair that you're sitting on. I don't know. Who invented the wheel? Who invented fire? And again, giving that gratification for the unknown humans that have given us so much in our history. So that is how we start off our curriculum every year. And we tell these stories every year. And as the children get older, maybe we'll give a few more details. Maybe we'll point something out one year that we hadn't pointed out the year before and get them excited. And every year, it brings back something else. And even if the child has heard the story up into the sixth grade every year, they still get excited because they're hearing something different or it's bringing up something that, oh, I, I wanted to look that up last year. Maybe I'll do it this year. So then, so this is what starts off our albums, is timelines like this and uh, stories like that. I just wanted to mention that when she's taking the course, we are given these, you know, we have to make the albums, and we are given at such and such age, you should have given this. So our curriculum, what we have to teach, it's in those albums and we have to follow that. Mm -hmm. So, um, should we go on? I again? just wanted you to mention the difference between the traditional, like the age groups, uh, you know, that we have three ages in, in the lower, just like oh, in the sure. primary, go ahead. Okay, so um, in the lower elementary and the upper elementary encompasses the three age groups. In the lower elementary, we go from six to eight or nine, um, and then from the upper elementary, it's from nine to 12. So it encompasses these age groups. And what's so great about having all three ages together is um, the children who first start off in the first grade and second grade, um, they become the leaders in the third grade, and they... Uh, can actually teach lessons to children in the younger ages. So if I had a third grader who was excellent with the checker checkerboard material, and I have a first grader who wants to start working with it more, instead of me giving a lesson, um, I could actually give that first grader to the third grader. So now the third grader is feeling like a hero. They're excited because they get to teach the lesson. I know that they're doing really well with the lesson because if you can teach something, you really know it. And then that first grader has someone to look up to somebody that they can go to to ask questions. And it creates this socialization. And the, in the second plane, as uh, Rena had mentioned, the child is looking for that socialization to get excited to talk to each other and to communicate. And we do have that need as humans all to talk to each other and to communicate and to <coughs> share ideas. And like it sets the child up later on for the real working world when we are communicating, collaborating as adults. Um, and then when we get into the upper elementary, we have the, the 9 to 12 year old ch child. And at that point, we're still giving the same curriculum because we give the cosmos, as Rena had said. We give the whole universe and everything in it. So if the child wants to research something, they can. But now, now that they're 9 or 10 or 11 or 12, they can delve even deeper. They can have longer researches. They can do bigger work, they can go out and they can meet experts in certain fields, so if they wanted to, I had, I had a child once who, um, she, she wanted to research chocolate. So she ended up um, doing all of this research and actually going out to a, a chocolate store. So she interviewed the manager of the chocolate store and wanted to know, like, how did you get this chocolate? How do you know if it's imported <coughs> properly? If it's uh, if children are working on I wasn't allowed to buy her she chocolate anymore. <laughs> she had a, a lot of um, a, a lot of information. She ended up writing a 20-page paper in the fifth grade on chocolate because she was so interested in it and found out where the, the cacao beans had come from, and it was just something that she was really excited about. So that's something that they get to do even more and just go off with. So in the older grades, and then of course with when it comes to um, biology and chemistry, we give even more levels of difficulty because now they've had, they've seen these ideas that there's chemical changes, there's physical changes when we have certain mixtures together. So the child can actually do these experiments with, you know, some adult supervision, uh, but at the same time they get to do so much more. So while the child is getting the same curriculum every single year throughout the all, all six years, each year we give a new level of difficulty and we give 
a new level of um, what it is that they've learned from before. And so they really get to take off with it. And it's incredible how far that they do get it, as far as math and reading and some some of the children, they just uh, they can't get enough of books. <laughs> so, um, I, I had a child who was reading The Book Thief. I don't know if anybody's mm -hmm. got it, but it's a mm -hmm. fantastic book. And she, was, she was in the sixth grade, and it was actually one of the eighth grade um, mandatory reading books at the time, but she just really wanted to read it, and had gotten so excited about it. So I just wanted to mention one other thing. If you walk into an elementary class, you will not see everybody doing doing language, or everybody doing math. You will see little groups, you know, they've chosen their work, and the teacher keeps an eye on who needs what material, so it's not that they're not being given, um, you know, individual attention. But you, will, one group will be working on geography, one group will be doing math, one group will be doing, you know, uh, something else of their interest. So you might see them, you know, talking and working on things, you know, different things, mm -hmm. as opposed to the traditional. Yes, Montessori said that the elementary classroom should be a, a beehive of uh, work. And uh, you'll see that So when, um, in the primary, the teacher will um, introduce a lesson to just one child. But in the elementary, we give small group lessons to three, even four children at a time. And that also encourages the groups. So, um, and we try to integrate the ages. So, in one lesson, we could have a first, second, and third level all together, learning the same thing. Um, but then now, those three students, they can work together on their own, and um, we can um, give. So, I don't have to use my curriculum as a checklist. I can start off one group of students on um, like the needs of plants and give them lessons on plants and we can talk about the root of the plant. And I can start off another group of children talking about the leaf. And so the children studying the root and the children studying the leaf, they talk to each other. Oh, you're <coughs> studying the root? Tell me about the root. You're studying the leaf? What does the leaf do? And that gives them even more of a reason to talk and to connect. And they don't even realize it, but they're teaching each other at the same time and getting each other excited about the curriculum. Should we uh, talk about some materials that, mm -hmm. uh, like the farm that we have over there in the primary class? Yes. So the children are um, introduced <coughs> to that um, each, you know, the function of words, but they are not given the names uh, of each, you know, like the noun. But that comes in the elementary. You want to go on? Mm -hmm. So uh, we, you probably are noticing these really cool, colorful boxes that we have here. These are called our grammar boxes. Um, and like Rena had said, we are introducing the words with these symbols. These are the grammar symbols. So um, this represents the noun. But in the primary, we don't tell the child that this is a noun. We just say, this is the symbol that goes with this card. And so in the primary, they, they know that they know these symbols, and they know what type of words go with the type of symbols. Um, the noun is a black triangle, and do we have a row? I was going to get one for you, yes. That would be great. Um, and the noun is used uh, as a triangle because it's the face of a pyramid, and Montessori said that the pyramid is, the triangle is the constructor. And the pyramid built by the Egyptians, thank you, mm -hmm. um, was the most solid construction uh, in history. So she used the black triangle to represent the noun. So in the <coughs> primary, a teacher will give a lesson on adjectives without the child realizing. She'll say, bring me a horse. And the child will go and get maybe the, the black horse and come back to the teacher. And she'll say, huh. Oh, not the horse that I wanted. So the child will go get another horse, and maybe she'll bring back the, the spotted horse. And the teacher will say, it's not the horse I wanted. The child, well, what horse do you want? Oh, oh, you want me to tell you what kind of horse I want? And so then you can say, bring me the brown horse. And now I've introduced adjectives, because now I'm describing the type of horse that I want. In the, prime, in the elementary, 
we have these large carts. So um, on the top, 